In this video, I'm going to do something that I've never done before, and I'm going to paint out of my head and let you guys follow along, and I'm going to sort of try to explain to you my process. But it's going to be, this landscape is going to be completely out of my imagination. I don't have a source that I'm looking at. Um, I can do that, um, you know, decently well if I'm doing a landscape, uh, trees and you know, vegetation and skies are abstract and I, and I feel like I can sort of do it. Um, there's certain things that I don't really feel like I am capable of painting out of my head. If I tried to do a portrait, I would uh, certainly not be able to paint it the level of realism that I can um, if, I, if I have a source to, to, to look at while I'm working. But this is just a change of pace and I thought you guys might enjoy uh, sort of hearing my thought process as I go through painting out of my head and painting this landscape. Uh, here's the finished painting here. And clearly I've left it uh, pretty loose. I did not polish it up uh, very much. Uh, that was just by intention. I kind of like it uh, the, the way it is. Um, if you want to learn how to paint realism, uh, this is not the video that you want to watch. This is for people who already have the fundamentals down <clears throat> as far as color mixing goes and um, drawing and, and, and even how to apply the paint to the canvas. Um, and so I have some videos that explain how to do that. Um, if you go to drawmixpaint.com, you'll see three videos highlighted, uh, how to paint in oil, um, how to draw in proportion, and how to mix color. So go watch those videos if you want to learn how to paint. This is just me with a lot of experience uh, painting a landscape out of my head. So I'm starting off with um, the uh, just the five Geneva palette colors um, and and this this is my essential palette and you can use other brands of paint but I'm using the Geneva paint paint because it's the paint that I make and, and the pigments are exactly the pigments that I like um, so here I am I'm just starting to uh, sketch in something and I really don't know what I'm doing and and that's the first point I should make whenever I paint out of my head I usually don't really have an idea what I'm doing and I just sort of start to make a mess and then look into the mess and try to see see something. And so I started off actually deciding I was going to have a big windswept tree um, going across the sky. And it's probably a good idea. I don't know why I didn't stick with it, but I at some point uh, decided against painting the tree. But I'm, I'm starting off here. And uh, so brown and blue. Uh, burn umber and ultramarine, French ultramarine are those two colors. Cadmium yellow, titanium white, and uh, that's pyrrole rubine is the red. Um, so I'm just mixing up some real basic gray, kind of darkish color. Um, I am definitely going to stay on the dark side of things. Uh, whenever I'm painting anything, I try to build from the shadow to the highlight. And at this point, I'm just really kind of painting without thinking too much. And it's a process that I've developed over the years. Whenever I paint anything organic or abstract, I mean, it could be actually a dress and, and folds in a fabric. But basically, I try to keep everything abstract in the sense that your tendency, and this goes for composition and subject matter and, and, and how you lay your paint down. Your tendency is to put a lot more order and uh, symmetry and, and, and pattern than is really there. And so I try to keep it, um, try not to think too hard when I, when I start to lay in these uh, landscapes. I even do things that I feel are wrong, and, and I don't know how to explain what I mean by that, but you know, I just try not to do exactly what I want to do, and I try to be bold. Um, one of the nice things about when I paint these landscapes is I can always scrape off and alter the color. You know, especially when you're dealing with skies that have a lot of milky whites in them and uh, anything off in the distance in the landscape, if there's, um, unless it's, if, if it's at any distance you're going to see milkiness as it goes off into the distance. Um, that's because as, as more and more dust and fog or whatever else is in the air builds up, it adds this gray layer to anything as it gets further and further away. So that's nice for an artist because it means that everything is basically milky. 
and in fact you have to make sure that anything in the distance is milky. You'll never see a black, black, black or a really dark color, you know, way off in the distance. Uh, you sort of have to decide um, just how light your lightest or your darkest black should be. In other words, you, you don't want it to be too dark or you'll throw the whole thing off. Now obviously that tree that I started to paint and, and anything in the foreground is not going to have all that air in it and so you are going to have some black blacks. But the sky um, is always going to be a little bit milky. Even if you have black clouds, they're still going to be grayed up. So as you can see, I kind of try to keep um, the quantity of paint at a minimum um, until I establish what I'm looking at. And that's because if I just barely cover the canvas, I mean, and, and I'm just smearing it on there, I'm not even, as you can see, I'm, I, I'm, the, the stain is coming through because I'm painting it so thinly. And that's fine. That allows me, uh, gives me more room to add more color. You know, once you get a ton of thick paint onto uh, the canvas, then it's, you have a real hard, hard time altering the color, or a harder time anyway. You can always alter the color. And now here I've decided I don't want to paint the tree. And, you know, one of the nice things about that is that tree is going to have its influence. All those gray colors are going to add this sort of uh, gray area across the middle there. And that's exactly what I mean by it wasn't thought out. It wasn't, I would have never put in those grays if I hadn't painted that tree. And now they've added some dynamic to the color and to the, to the composition. So I'm really, as I lay in these colors, I am not the slightest bit worried about whether the blue's too blue or, or anything. I'm, I'm sort of getting a basic color scheme. I very much am allowing the stain to show through and, and, and add some color to it because I'm putting such a thin layer. But I really like to start off with this super thin layer just because it allows me to, to play more. And it, I mean, I can still paint right on top of that. Um, and as you know, I keep changing my uh, brush work. Um, you know, I, I tend to paint horizontally because that's the the direction of the of the sky, you know, it's in layers that are, that are stacked on top of each other. So I move left to right instead of vertical. But um, I'm even. You can see I do this a lot. I tend to roll my brush or slide it or scrape it or do do things that are going to create sort of a a unique abstract pattern. Um, and if you just paint in, in a normal way, you, you just don't get all that all that uh, interesting uh, abstraction in, in, your, in your paint. And the sky actually looks pretty good at this point. And you'll notice I could have stopped right there and sort of, you know, fix that, that sky and use that basic sky just as it is. And I kind of like it, but I ended up playing with it and messing with it and altering the colors tremendously and then coming around. And in the end, I think it turned out a lot better. But um, you sort of have to be bold and, and not be satisfied and also be daring all the time. Be willing to uh, mess things up and scrape it off and redo. In total, I added up the entire the, the entire footage because I ran my cameras the whole time I painted it. it. This took me about three and a half hours to paint, and that includes you know um, leaning back and and looking and thinking about what I'm doing and cleaning brushes out and and uh, everything else. But basically, that was and I did that in I think three sittings, basically. So here I'm I'm sort of liking the sky and decide and and I'm sort of deciding whether I want to just leave it as it is and you're gonna see that I can that I change it you know dramatically later on but at this point I'm deciding you know I think I might like this and I and I start to starting to put a little bit of 
um, I don't know, know what I'm doing actually, trying to put some cloud formations off in the distance or something, but um, yeah, I just, uh, I guess in the end I I just didn't, just decided I wanted to have more dynamic color. But I was pretty lost through this first period, and that's very typical of me when I'm doing these uh, landscapes. Once I start them, you know, it's like torture because, uh, and I say that with, uh, I don't, I don't mean, it, you know, it's like you love, I love to do these landscapes. I actually do. This is my favorite kind of painting to paint out of my head. Um, if the pro, if you have to fix a problem, it's not really hard and, and difficult to do that. You can just go in and attack it. But when you start off and you're trying to decide if you like something or not, I generally don't like what I'm doing and uh, sometimes it helps to have another person you know tell me that it's looking okay um, because I really do get lost in these landscapes that I'm painting out of my head I just you know I, I can convince myself that it's just garbage and sometimes it's hard to see whether you're doing anything or not now here I've decided to put some trees sort of in the foreground um, or a row of trees going off toward the horizon and uh, I don't get very far with that before I decide that, that I don't like that idea but that's why I was putting those black lines and again that'll end up affecting the composition and uh, adding some interesting you know um, interesting patterns or, or rather interesting uh, just add to the composition itself by by putting in some shadows here and there so that's so I'm mixing up some more black and uh, just in the foreground here you definitely want to have black blacks because there's no you know air there's no distance between you and the ground, not enough that it's going to put milkiness into the air. So in the foreground, if it's you know less than, I don't know, 30 feet, it's going to be black black. Now obviously if you're out in the fog or, or somewhere, a dusty road or something, that would be different. And you know, at this point, I'm not even, it's a funny thing, if you paint, I'm not painting trees, I'm not painting rocks, I'm not painting anything. I don't have anything in my head. I'm just giving myself something to look at. And I just kind of know that these, these sort of patterns of, you know, sort of horizontal dashes and, and shapes and blobs, um, you know, I don't know what it's going to look like, but it gives me something to look into that I can play with. It could end up being bushes or or trees or, or whatever. So that certainly has to be milky way off in the distance there. You can't leave any black blacks. In fact, there's a few spots up near the horizon that I'm going to have to definitely milk up because they just don't belong. You can't have black blacks off in the distance. It just doesn't exist. I suppose if you were in super, super clear air, you could go a certain distance, but certainly not miles. You know, it's funny, while I watch this video, I start seeing interesting things in the landscape that I never developed. And if I would have seen those things, when I say things, I mean, you know, some vista with a, a field off in the distance or some trees or whatever it is, I start to be able to see in the, in the abstract shapes. Um, you know, you have to look for it. You have to stop and, and, and see if you see anything. And I just saw something.
but obviously I didn't see it when I was painting it. And that's fine because I went a different direction. I do like blue-green skies. It's something that I, uh, I tend to do a lot of when I do these landscapes out of my head. At least years ago when I, when I used to do them. And this was completely painted with the French Ultramarine. I didn't have to get out any phthalo blue at all to get any of those blue-greens. Um, and that's just because they're not very strong. Um, if you do use thalo blue in a landscape like this, it's, it's just a nightmare. I mean, it, it just gets into everything. You really have to know what you're doing. Um, whereas the ultramarine, you can push it around from blue to, to gray and, and even, even neutralize it completely. But the thalo is just trouble. It just ends up staining, you know, all your all your colors end up getting that phthalo blue in them. It drives, it drives me crazy. Not to say that I don't use it. There are occasions when I've, when I've used it. Certainly in, many years ago in the past, I did a whole series of very, very blue-green night scenes out of my head. And they were all painted with lots and lots of phthalo blue. Windsor blue is a, is a phthalo blue, and that's what I used to use or Windsor Turquoise. And by the way, Geneva Fine Art, we should have our Thalo Blue for sale here in, in uh, hopefully, hopefully a month or two. We've got all the pigment ordered and should be here soon. And then we just have to make it. So putting a little bit of uh, more blue into those hills off in the distance, and that's because my sky has got so much blue in it that I just feel like uh, it's just a logic thing. You're not going to have those brown hills with a blue sky like that. And as you go into the distance, the, the distance adds blue and sometimes purple. Purple Mountain, Purple Mountain Majesty. So here's where I'm getting frustrated, and I'm deciding, you know what, I don't like this, and I'm trying to, you know, do something to it. And again, this is the nice thing about these landscapes. Anything I do, I can, can take out. And sometimes I go crazy, like, oh, I won't say crazy, but this color is just so wrong, and that's exactly why I'm using it because I just feel like the color's dead and it needs to have some dy dynamic, you know, it needs to be more jump around a bit. So I've put the red in and then I just scraped it off with a scraper. And now I'm just kind of fixing some of my scraper lines. I don't like those little ridges of paint. But the scraper does make some really nice, uh, interesting, abstract um, patterns. I love using a scraper when I'm painting a sky. So little trees in the distance and I'm gonna for sure go in and milk those little trees up because uh, you can see as I did that because as I said before there's just no blacks off in the distance. So there's a way that I paint uh, in an abstract way, and it's kind of a combination of like rolling my brush, um, you know, swinging it around, bumping the canvas in weird ways. <laughs> it's just a, something that I've developed over the years, but it's all an effort to paint abstract and not to, not to create these regular patterns that, that humans tend to do when they, when they, you know, try to paint or draw or do anything. We just tend to put a lot more pattern than is really there. So now trying to get a, just a little bit of uh, 
yellow orange glow um, on the horizon and that's again a logical thing um, if you ever look at the sunset as it just starts the sky above your head can still be quite blue when the horizon starts to turn golden and so that's why I've decided to put a little bit of gold in my uh, her right above the horizon in the light so you can see what a nice uh, job that scraper does it gets rid of all the extra paint so it makes it a lot easier to go in and adjust colors but it um, it also makes just nice patterns uh, especially cloud patterns this was my point of frustration and that's why I'm getting this red I'm like I'm just I feel like the sky is just a bunch of grays and I want it to have some more um, you know contrasting um, colors in other words uh, the um, blue is the opposite of orange red is the opposite of green and so I try to try to get some uh, complementary colors working against each other so now I've decided to start on the um, put a little bit more work into the foreground I think I first started to think I was gonna paint a grassy field that was being lit up I don't remember what I was doing maybe I thought about water for a second and now I'm just leaving in some of that glow but gonna paint you know trees on the other side of the field and so those are just dark shadows because that's what you would see and now I'm just trying to get out of my rut I don't know what I'm doing I think I was completely lost And when I get lost in the landscape, I tend to to just really try to make um, a big difference quickly. You know, take a big brush and some new color and just put it in and knowing that it's going to look wrong and, and uh, but I can decide if it's moving in the right direction or not. One of the things I, I never do is I never try to uh, put in brush strokes for the sake of putting in brushwork. In other words, I, I don't deliberately go in and, and try to put in, you know, paint strokes that are visible. Um, I just try to paint in a sort of carefree way or to really think about my subject. Um, and not think about the brushwork itself and just attack the, the painting and let the brushwork uh, come naturally. Every stroke that I paint, you know, is not an effort to make a paint stroke, but rather it's, um, you know, I'm trying to affect my work in some direction and it just so happens that that's the paint stroke that does it. Now I'm getting really frustrated and when I do something like this I very much am aware that I'm ruining the painting and that it's completely wrong but that's how you discover things and when this painting is done all of that red you'll still find bits of it here or there so I put in the red, I knew it was completely wrong, and then I thought to myself, okay, let me get rid of the red by putting green on it. Green is the opposite of red. And now I've decided, oh, heck, it's all wrong. Let me scrape this off. But as you see, even with all that, 
there's some interesting bits developing. I don't know if you can see it. I mean, it looks wrong, but I can continue to fix it. And in the process, I'm going to leave behind uh, remnants of, of, you know, the red. And it's going to add a whole lot of vibrancy and, and uh, to this color and make it a lot more interesting. So I'm in complete fix mode now. I'm, I'm going back and I'm saying, okay, the red is clearly not going to work. So let me just put some color on top of it. And uh, I can probably, you know, I can scrape it off again if I need to. And, you know, I talk about not blending a lot and you'll see me blend a lot when I paint these paintings but it's um, the reason it's different when I'm painting like this is because I'm very much mixing my colors on the canvas so therefore when I go in and throw a bunch of color into uh, and sometimes I'll take like pure blue and just throw it in uh, you know and I'm very much mixing that color and blending that color into the color on the canvas so that I do do affect it and um, but when I teach to paint you know using by color checking and by mixing your colors ahead of time and everything when you do that it's different because then you don't want to blend because you already have the color right and the whole point of the exercise is to lay in the colors the way you mixed them but in this case I can look at the landscape and decide if it's too gray and if I've mixed milked up the colors then I'll go in and take some burn umber and get rid of the, the milk burn umber is the opposite of milk by the way it's it's just orange you know like a dark yellow red or dark orange which is the very opposite of milk so if you ever have milk in a painting you can just take pure burn umber and and work it into it as long as you're not affecting the value too much and if it's a light color, you can just take pure orange. So here I'm just, you know, I remember this was probably the point when I was thinking that my landscape was a total flop and that it would never work. And in some ways, that's a fun uh, time because then you can just really have fun and really go for it and try new things like I'm doing with the yellow. You know, once you start making it look nice and you start liking it then you can't do this so in some ways when it's not working it's a lot more fun because you're still discovering but it can also be extremely frustrating and you know after enough time you finally just give up and decide that that the painting's not going to work I would say a third or even half of the paintings that I do out of my head I throw away um, because I d decided they, they didn't work. But they don't take very long. A little bit of sky poking through. And I think the reason that I decided to put some blue sky up there and up in the top was so that you would, so the viewer would be aware that there's, you know, it's not a pure sunset. There's still a lot of brightness left in the sky. And therefore, the foreground, I can lighten up a good bit and it'll make sense. If it was just a pure sunset, then the foreground would be almost black. But I want to put some, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lighten up that foreground a good bit. And so therefore, um, by putting that light blue sky up in the top, you know, you could imagine that over the, over the, the foreground, there, there's going to be enough light to, to light it up a bit. And it'll make more sense. 
So I had some little trees there and I finally decided to get rid of the trees completely and just turn it into a, a big smooth mountain off in the distance. And I'm going to have to milk that up, and which I did. I cut out a good bit of this because I didn't want this video to be too long. But I was, you know, there's always mountains get purple a lot as they go off into the distance. And these mountains are being lit by that blue sky that's uh, up in the top. And so therefore there's a lot of blue light even though the, in the distance there's still a lot of the gold um, which is also hitting the clouds. But by uh, having purple mountains next to a yellowish sky, purple and yellow are opposite complementary colors and so that's always going to look pretty. That's one of those rules I learned um, from looking at Sargent's paintings. John Singer Sargent is that one of, the, one of the things he does a lot is he'll have a strong color with a dirty complement. So the strong color in this painting, there really isn't a real strong color, maybe some of the blues up in the sky. But you have blue and you have uh, the, the yellow uh, on the horizon. Now, by the way, I, I turned the exposure up a little bit on this uh, for the second half of this because I was painting the foreground, which wasn't getting as much light in the studio because it's further away from my studio light. And also, um, I just wanted you guys to be able to see it a little better, so I upped the exposure a bit. So now is the process of, light, of um, putting some light into the foreground. And I always like to paint on top of uh, this black and to really have all my darks. And now I'm going back to attempting to put trees over there. These would be fields off in the distance, I guess. The nice thing about landscapes is you don't really have to know even what it is. You just can be anything. I do have to be careful about not milking up everything in the foreground. And, uh, you know, there's, there's always, uh, this, this landscape has a lot of gray, there's a lot of gray because of the blue sky and because it's late in the day, the shadows, and, you know, the vegetation. I have no problem with all the gray in there. That's a nice color. Um, but you do have to be careful that you leave little bits of that black black. And so you have to really watch yourself and not just destroy all those black blacks. You've got to leave little bits of it. And then if you'll notice, way off in the distance, I don't have any black blacks at all. And if I do, I'll go in and, and fix them. trying to get a little bit of detail off in the background or rather in the in the distance and this painting was actually uh, the the colors are a little richer um, not quite as blue as they came out in my camera my camera uh, the video cameras don't do color perfectly every time and especially struggle with some of these greenish grays as far as the accuracy goes. I did take an accurate picture of it which I'll show you at the end with a regular camera so you can see the true colors but these are pretty close. So just a lot of this kind of work, um, I cut out a lot of that 
a little detail work, but there's just a ton of that. So now I'm going in and deciding it's too gray, and I'm taking some nice, rich burn umber with some yellow in it. And it's got a little bit of green in it, but it's mainly a very rich um, orangey color, which is really going to um, be nice with that blue. Because blue is the opposite of orange, so the, the two of those colors dancing around in the vegetation is a pleasant mix. If you ever have a color that's monochromatic, just take the complement, and the complement is the color on the opposite side of the color wheel. And here I'm uh, just deciding it's all too much jumble, 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 I guess, and trying to put in some something, uh, you know, a field or whatever it was. I didn't like that hill. See, those are very non-milky colors. Burnt umber, yellow, red. Anything on the orange side is the opposite of milk. Just a little bit of detail in the foreground especially because your eye expects to see it. So there's a close-up shot, and these were taken with my regular camera, so the colors are more true. Um, just some close-ups of all the brushwork, and then uh, there's the finished painting. If you go to drawmixpaint.com, you can find links to all my free videos. If you go to genevafineart.com, you can find out all about the paint that I use to paint with, that I manufacture myself right here in Austin, Texas. And thank you so much for watching.